Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Better Machine Learning Models with Multi-Objective Optimization. I'm Haley Mattisa with RapidMiner, and I'll be your moderator for today's session. I'm joined today by RapidMiner founder and president, Dr. Ingo Mierswell. Ingo will get started in just a few minutes, but first, a few quick housekeeping items for those on the line. Today's webinar is being recorded, and you'll receive a link to the on-demand version via email within one to two business days. You're free to share that link with colleagues who are not able to attend today's live session. Second, if you have any trouble with audio or video today, your best bet is to try logging out and logging back in, which should resolve the issue in most cases. Finally, we'll have a question and answer session at the end of today's presentation. Please feel free to ask questions at any time via the question panel on the right-hand side of your screen. We'll leave time at the end to get to everyone's questions. I'll now go ahead and pass it over to Inga. Excellent. Thanks, Heidi. All right, um, so today's topic really is about how can we actually get to better models? And the whole idea is not really just to to figure out how can we make a better model selection? Is now, let's say, gradient boosted trees better than deep learning? Or is uh, linear regression maybe the model of choice here? Um, that is an important topic as well, but that's not really what we're going to solve. So it's really more about like, well, if you already have some good model candidates and some good results, how can you really enhance it? How can you actually get better models? And one of the, my go-to techniques for that is um, actually using multi-objective optimization. And, um, I spent quite a bit of time uh, on this on this topic actually when I was also still a researcher, um, and so I'm really really happy to share some of the things I figured out um, back then with you guys and hope you can actually make good use of this to to improve your machine learning results. So um, before I get actually into the topic, um, just one uh, well two sentences about myself. Um, yeah, as Haley said, I um, I found a rapid miner. Um, many, many, many years ago, I'm still a data scientist at heart. I, I still really try to solve most of the things we can solve by using data and using data science methods to, to really get to the ground of things and figure out what needs to be done and how can we improve um, our own business. But of course, I did this also with a lot of organizations in, in the past. I, I was working as a consultant uh, many years, um, actually before it even was called data science and before people actually even talked about machine learning. So that was a little bit of head of the curve. Um, my main gig was probably for like five years in the pharmaceutical industry, although I'm by no means an expert, um, even after those five years for that industry. But anyway, so yeah, I have a little bit of practical experience, research experience, and then of course, since I founded the company Rapid Miner, um, I have been hearing a lot about how our users and customers um, solving their data science problems. So that's um, about me. Um, and then and maybe let's just dive into this. As I said, I spend a lot of time of my own research on this topic, and that at the end led to my um, PhD. So I was, um, when I was still in Germany, I was working on this whole thing. Um, and the title of the PhD is, is on the screen right now. It's Non-Convex and Multi-Objective Optimization for Statistical Learning and Numerical Feature Engineering. And I totally get if you really don't have any clue what this whole thing is about at this point. And that's just the typical thing we stupid researchers are always doing, coming up with a very fancy sounding PhD title to um, actually, well, yeah, figure out um, or actually impress the people and show off a little bit. So um, forget about the title, but you saw already there is this multi-objective topic in there. And that is really something I realized quite early when I, when I started using machine learning, this is, an, a, this is an ongoing thing when you create machine learning models. And it's not just for the machine learning itself, it's actually also for most of the pre-processing tasks we have and all the things we do around machine learning. So if you have a look on the screen right now, you have two major topics um, in machine learning. I mean, of course, we have different model types like for regression or association rules, but hey, let's stay simple here for a bit and let's talk about classification models first on the right and also one of the things you often want to do is to figure out what are the best input factors for your machine learning model and um, by reducing those input factors hopefully you can actually get more accurate models by focusing on the signals and a little less on the noise but also typically it has other advantages the models are simpler they're more robust and they also can be trained in faster time so those are two important topics, and I guess every data scientist are, is dealing with those topics kind of on a daily basis. But as I said before, if you do feature selection, or if you, do, if you learn a classification model, in this example here, it's, a, it's let's say, a linear uh, large margin method, let's say, like a support vector machine. Um, so where we try to find this linear separating hyperplane, this white line in the middle to, to distinguish between the green and the orange points. 
what do those two things really have in common? And that was maybe the first big, whatever, Eureka or aha moment I really had, like to really realize actually they all have one thing in common. And that is really that you never only have one goal, but you always have multiple goals. And unfortunately, that makes this problem of machine learning so hard. They always compete with each other. It's not that simple that you, while you're improving on one of your targets and one of your goals, it's easy to also improve on all the others. Typically, there's some form of trade-off. So for example, for feature selection, if you have more features, you give more information to the, to the models uh, you do the feature selection for. And that often leads to more accurate models. But as I said before, the models are getting more complex and they, are, they take longer to train. And sometimes you have more risk of overfitting as well. So it's not that easy to then saying like, well, then let's give everything to the model. You need really need to make a good trade-off between the simplicity and robustness of the model and the understandability of the model on one hand, and fewer features help you there, and then on the other hand, the, the power, the accuracy of the model on the other hand, and this is the trade-off you have there. And for classification models, th things are really similar, and that's true basically for all the model types as well. So it's not that simple than just optimizing for the training error of the model. In fact, that's the last thing you should optimize it for, but of course, most machine learning models need to do this at, to some degree. So of course, you don't want to find a linear separating hyperplane which just goes across all those classes and doesn't separate anything. That is not the goal. You want to have a good model which separates correctly most of the orange and the green points. But it's okay to do some errors. Let's, for example, say this would not be a linear line, but like some curve which really carves out the, the green point um, which is part of the orange group and the orange point which is part of the green group. Yeah, sure, that would be more correct in terms of training error, but at the same time, the model gets more complex and it's more likely that you will make more errors on, on the testing error. Again, it's really about this trade-off and it's really about figuring out what is the right trade-off to get to the best results in the future. So it's all about trade-offs, it's always about multiple objectives, it's always about those conflicts. And that is true for basically all machine learning models. And funnily enough, even true for like lots of the things like the meta-modeling we do around the machine learning, like feature selection, parameter optimization, and so on. So that is the problem we had. And do we, are we doing a good job of solving that? Well, sometimes. Um, so you probably are familiar with the term of regularization. Um, in case you're not, uh, you really should become familiar with this because this is one of the main concepts in machine learning, uh, which helps us to actually build better models, which generalize better to, to unseen data points. So the basic idea is really what we call, well, or it's based on, on what we also know as Occam's razor. Um, so the basic idea is if you have multiple solutions for the same problem, often it is the simplest solution, the most simple solution, which is the correct one, which um, is just like something you probably saw in life as well. If you really need to bend over backwards to actually get to, to some point and, or, or explain something, and then if you really take a step back and think, Think about this again, you find a simpler solution. Often, that is really the, the correct one and the best way to go forward. And that is just something which is long known for like thousands of years, um, known as Occam's razor. And regularization of machine learning really takes this, this concept and formalizes this, this in a mathematical way. Um, the whole idea is, for example, if I go back here to the classification model, that having this like curve which, which wobbles around all, around all your data points just to make it all perfect and, and reduce the training error, well, you get more complexity. So it's a more complex model, and often this is just not the correct one. So you, you should avoid that uh, in most of the cases. So regularization is what, what allows machine learning models to really, um, well, formalize this idea and to optimize for both goals at the same time. And that's fine. We know that. Uh, uh, since decades probably now, and most of the machine learning models have some flavor of regularization built in. But most of those meta-modeling uh, heuristics like feature selection or parameter optimization, they don't. And even in machine learning, it often requires from the user to actually make, define the, the importance of those conflicting goals ahead of time, and you can't really do this. So what I did in the PhD, and that was, that was the whole topic, was making this trade-off, making this conflict explicit and trying to optimize for both goals or multiple goals at the same time and getting all the possible solutions for all reasonable trade-offs at the same, in the same time that one optimization run of a, of a model or a feature selection would take. So I did this for like 10, 12 different topics, uh, including machine learning, which didn't work out that well, I have to be honest here, so I don't spend a lot of time on that, but if you're interested in learning more about that, feel free to download my PhD, read a little bit about this. But 
the short summary is um, doing this for machine learning in most of the times is not super helpful, especially not for large margin methods, um, not really super helpful for decision trees. To be really honest, the whole neural network deep learning craze wasn't that big when I was doing my research. Um, that might be a topic which is interesting again. So if you want to actually use what you learn today and apply to machine learning directly, um, looking for doing multi-objective optimization for optimizing network architectures might be something um, that is worth looking into. But that's not the topic for today. For today, I really thought um, in the interest of time, I focus on one major problem, which still actually is a major problem, even in the time of, of deep learning and, and um, great boosted trees, um, which are very powerful and do not need the same level of feature engineering than many other methods, and that is feature selection. So what we're going to do now is we discuss feature selection, we discuss the current state of the art, and I'm going to show you how you can use multi-objective optimization to get to a much better result and much more insights in the same amount of optimization time. So that's cool. But as a, almost as a side effect, uh, we also can then solve a problem which typically people consider to be not solvable or unsolvable, whatever the right word is. So the point really is, um, for unsupervised learning like clustering, there is, well, there are people who try to do feature selection and it doesn't really work very well. And I would like to take a little bit on a journey there to make the same experience as I did when I actually was proving out why it's just not working in general. But then after we went on this journey, at the end, I will also show you how you can still solve it. And that is pretty awesome because frankly, most of the times whenever you do unsupervised learning, you can't do it really at all. And you will get all kinds of clusters. Unfortunately, they have zero meaning just because they kind of model the, the noise in your data. And it's really hard to figure that one out. So that is the topic for today, and let's go into this, let's discuss with the, the state of the art, and then we take from there and improve uh, the state of the art. And you can then transfer your learnings basically also on to, to other areas of machine learning. All right, so feature selection, super simple. Um, let's start with the feature set of 10 features or attributes as we call them in Rapid Minor, or columns if you think more like tables in Excel. So let's say we have those 10 features, and we could, of course, use all of them. But as I said before, even for those modern, more modern machine learning methods, that is often not a good idea. Because if you hand over too much noise to the machine learning method, then it starts modeling the noise as the risk of overfitting rises. And yeah, it just takes longer. It's, uh, it's harder to understand the model if it can use more features. So let's find a subset of those 10 features in this example, which works best in the terms of what is delivering the best accuracy. So can we figure that one out? Um, well, how can we do that? Let's, for example, start with only using one feature. Um, to make things simple, we start with the first one. Okay, if we start the first one, I can train a model using only this feature, and I can also validate this model, let's say with, with a cross-validation, like a tenfold cross-validation, and I can actually see how well this model performs. And since we started talking about classification, let's just pick any measure, like performance criterion, in this case, for example, accuracy, to measure this. So if you only use this one feature, and we feed this data set using only this one feature into a cross-validation using any machine learning method, we could, for example, measure that we get a 68% accuracy. All right, that's good, let's move on. Now we can, for example, try a different feature, let's say number two. We can validate this model again only using this feature, and we see, for example, that the accuracy is only 64%, which means it's just a little bit less good than the, the one only using one feature. And we can go on like that. So only using the third feature, for example, delivering, for example, a model um, with 59% accuracy. So boohoo, that's not really good. So let's talk about this one. The first one so far was definitely the best. And it can go on and on um, until I tried all the 10 different options, and after I did this, well, of course, that's only the options with the, only using one feature. Well, what about using two features? Sure, let's start with the first two. Let's measure that one. Oh, look at that, 70% accuracy, a little bit better. So far, our best candidate, let, let's say. So that's good. Let's just try the other combinations of two features, and so on, then with three and four features, until we finally tried everything using all 10 features. And as you can see, the accuracy for that model would only be 62%. And that tells you right there, well, it would be a good idea to only use a subset. For example, the, the, the second from the bottom using two features, which has a much higher accuracy. And it uses less features. Again, model training is faster, and the models are simpler. It's easier to understand them. Okay, so far, so good. But as you can probably guess already, that 
might take some time because I need to go through all those combinations of, well, different feature set sizes. And based on the 10 features I have, how many combinations are there? Well, computer scientists should know this answer like right away. Um, if you have 10 features and you can turn them on and off, so you have two options for every feature, that gives you two to the power of 10 combinations, which sums up to 1,024 different combinations for 10 attributes. And frankly, that's not exactly true because the one combination where you don't use any features or basically all zeros, that's not really a good idea because you can't build any model there. So actually it's 1,023 combinations, but yeah, whatever. So point is two to the power of 10 um, combinations, and that's a lot. And think, think about, well, for every combination, we need to do a tenfold cross-validation. That means we need to learn 10 or train 10 different models. So we end up with more than 10,000 models in this case. And that's for only 10 features. So what about 100 features? And of course, the easy answer is, well, 100 features, that delivers, well, two to the power of 100 combinations. But that's a number which is not easy to, to think about. If you write it out, for 100 features, the total number is 1,267,650,626,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,
you can turn this into the multi-objective optimization problem quite easily, which is not really possible with the other solutions. So um, since many of you might not know how they work, I will get, just give you like a super brief introduction how evolutionary algorithms work, and then I will show you on a data set how, well, the results can look like if you don't do any feature selection, then what you can achieve with forward selection and backward elimination, and why there is a problem. And then I show you the results you can achieve with evolutionary algorithms, and then you move to multi-objective from there. So how do they work? So in general, they try to mimic, as many things in machine learning uh, claim to mimic, some natural processes, evolutionary algorithms doing the same, like, you know, this whole survival of the fittest, or uh, like having a population of individuals which are um, mates, can I say mates, who knows, um, and then they create offspring, and then there's maybe some mutation. So there's a lot of those ideas you probably remember from your biology classes. Um, and But again, it, it mimics it. it, it it's, it's, an, it's a metaphor, but it's not really the same thing, I guess. I mean, really, I'm not an expert for that part, but um, but it's the same idea. So you start with some population, you create a population of random individuals. And an individual is really this kind of like this binary bit vector we have seen before. Um, and, and the one basically means, well, I use this feature, and the zero means I don't use it. And then if you, let's say, you start with a population of 10 individuals, then you start creating new ones. Um, uh, <clears throat> let's not go into the biology uh, aspect here, but, but you, yeah, you do technically crossover, um, and some part of the DNA of this bit vector is taken from one parent, and other parts are taken from the other parent, and the offspring share um, DNA from both parents, I guess. Um, okay, so good. So the easiest thing you could do here is basically select like randomly one cutting point, like um, after the fourth feature here in this example, and then you create the two offspring by taking the both yellow parts and create a new one, a new child, and you can, even if you want, you can generate a second child while you're on this by um, also combining the two green parts. So that's one way. There's many ways how you can do crossover. And um, well, but let's not go into the details here. So now you generate a couple of children. That's good. But in biology, um, what often happens is that those children also have some mutations. So in here, what it really means is it's just randomly flipping um, like single spots in this in this DNA in this in this bit vector. Okay. Now, let me explain to you why both steps are important. Crossover helps you if you have like feature bit vectors in different spaces of this fitness universe. If I go back to this one, just like different spots in this fitness landscape, crossover helps you to basically well jump to completely different areas, which hopefully are promising again in this fitness landscape. So that helps you to get out of those local minima or local, sorry, local maxima, local extrema in general, and jump to other space, um, places in the fitness landscape. But mutations are smaller changes, and they really help you, if you already are in some good area, help you to slowly climb further toward the, the, the hill, hoping if you're close to the global maximum, that some of those mutations then help you moving further towards uh, the top of the hill. So, I mean, it's a bit of a rough explanation, but, but you get the, the, the idea. Yeah, I hope we have it behind both points. So after you did this, now you have the parents, you have a couple of um, children, some of them mutated, and often you use some parameters, like for example, the probability for mutation is one divided by the number of features you have, so that on average you can expect having one mutation for every individual here, okay? So then after you have this new population, you can evaluate them, and you can do this exactly the same way we did this for the brute force discussion we just had, by just taking the data set, taking only the features which have a one, feed this data set then into, um, into a cross-validation and measure, for example, the accuracy. And you do this for all the individuals in the population, which brings me to the next step, the selection. So this here really is about the whole survival of the fittest um, aspect. And one of the most frequently used um, selection schemes you could use is called tournament selection. And later on, you will see that this is, in fact, the only thing that changed to turn this into a multi-objective um, optimization approach. So tournament selection, um, the idea here is you pick a um, specified number of individuals, let's say five, and then you just throw them all into one pit and, and, and just let them fight against each other and the winner takes it all. So let's, for example, say your original population has 40 individuals, then you just pick five random individuals like over and over again, and for every sample you take, you take the winner and put them into the next generation's population. And the others, they can still stay in the, in the old one and they can be picked again. So and of 
of course, if you make big tournaments with a lot of um, samples, um, then of course you increase the selection pressure, so only the fittest ones will survive. But if you make like, smaller tournaments, then by chance you might also just pick a couple of weaker individuals, and then even the weaker individuals have a chance for survival. And that sometimes is a good idea because, well, sometimes, yeah, you start off a little bit weak, but you actually, when, when you, for example, cross over some of those weaker individuals, you might actually jump into some very promising areas of the fitness landscape as well. So don't set the uh, tournament size like equal to the population size because that, that would really mean only the fittest individual would survive. Um, and that is typically not a good idea. So you want to know actually, well, some form of evolution happening over, over time. Okay. Anyway, so that's how, how this whole thing works and after you did this for like a specified number of generations for example you would just deliver the best solution you found and that is then the feature set uh, which is the winner okay awesome so then let's actually do all of this let's do no feature selection let's do some forward um, selection backward elimination and some evolutionary feature selection on a data set which i think is a pretty good one for feature selection and some of you might know it already it's the so-called sonar data set and the idea for, of this data set is that you have um, a frequency spectrum for each data point um, so you have a value for like 60 different frequency bands and then for each spectrum you have a label which tell or target which tells you if this spectrum of an object uh, of a sonar that's why the data set is called sonar if this spectrum represents the spectrum of a rock or if it represents the spectrum of a mine. And of course, that's an important question. Let's think about military boats or something who want to find those mines for whatever reason. So that is, uh, of course, important for them. I mean, I'm a sailor, so I wouldn't care as long as I see something which resembles a rock or a mine, I wouldn't just go there. But I guess uh, it's an important application. Oh, sorry. So let's actually go into Rapid Miner. Um, and I would like to show you how this whole thing works in practice. So. Um, many of you might know RapidMine already, so I'm not going to explain a, a, a lot here, but for those of you who see it for the very first time, the whole idea of RapidMine is to build analytical processes or workflows in this big white area here in the center, and then basically using data sets uh, coming from those repositories here on the, on the top left, and using operators here from the bottom left to basically transform the data or build models or validate models and do everything you need to do for machine learning and data science in general, or just data prep and, 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 and even ETL for, for that matter. So, um, well, that's kind of the basic idea and you will probably get it by just looking at this. I mean, you can add your own custom built code like with R and Python and everything else, but typically the, the, the major working mode in Rapid Miner is actually not to code, it's really to build those visual workflows, which is a much faster way of getting to some good results. It's also easier to share with others, to collaborate with others, and um, yeah, uh, to also maintain those models and, and, and workflows in the future. So I've prepared one, one of those workflows for you here. Um, all this workflow is doing is it loads the Sonar data set. I added this little red breakpoint here, which means I stop after this data set is loaded, so we can actually inspect um, the data set quickly before we, before we move on. Then and this data set is delivered to this cross-validation. You can see here there's a lot of parameters on the right side. And I always, in all those experiments we do today, I will do a five-fold cross-validation. Typically, you would do a ten-fold. That would work, of course. It just takes double amount of time. And since I don't want to waste our time now waiting uh, for cross-validation results, I just go with a five-fold cross-validation today. Another important thing for those validation years that I always make the data split in exactly the same way. Because I want to show you the effect of the feature selection and the model building. I don't want you to show the effect uh, random, different random splits of the data can have. So um, again, um, you can change all of this um, if, if you like, but, but I want to prove some points here. So that's why I go with this fixed data split and using this, what we call the local random seeds. Okay, just to make it, um, well, repeatable, but also to make it fair so that all the different methods use exactly the same data. Yes, good. Okay, so and then inside of this cross validation, one of the specialties of Rapid Miner is that you always can dive into those operators. So I made a double click here on this one. So whenever you see this icon here, that means you can dive into this one here. And then you see basically what happens in the training phase and the uh, application, the testing phase. So here I just train a knife based model. It doesn't really matter because, as I said, it works for all model types. Knife based is just a quick, good baseline model. So let's get started with this one here. 
and I train this model here, and I apply the model here on the, on the test data, which I get delivered from, from the parent operator, and calculate the performance, which really is, uh, yeah, just making a couple of smart choices here. In this case, uh, one of the things we calculate is the accuracy. Um, this model approach has a lot of advantages. So we could, for example, also put some pre-processing methods inside of the cross-validation. That's a very important thing to do, and one of the major mistakes I see most data scientists doing, doing over and over again, mostly because it's so hard to do with, with other solutions, or even if you program it yourself, it's a lot of work. If you're interested in how you correctly validate those models, I wrote actually a couple of blog posts on this, and did another webinar, I guess, on, on that topic. Did I? Well, definitely I did. A, yeah, well, one thing you could check out as the how to ruin your your um, business with the data science webinar I did last year. Um, it's also a fun one. So if you're interested in correct validation, check it out. Um, it's it's really important to do this right. Anyway, so that's the whole idea of Rapid Miner. So let's get started. I can execute processes here, and I said I have a breakpoint. So let's have a look at the data first. It's only 60 columns here, and every column, every attribute, every feature represents a certain frequency band of our frequency spectrums. And then we have the two classes, rock up here and mine down there. And as a human being, obviously, although it's only 200 rows, I mean, this is all numbers. I mean, there's no way that I could see any patterns here. And even if I start visualizing this here, for example, the scatter plot, like, well, yeah, how can I distinguish rocks against mines? It all is overlapping, so there's not a lot of pattern I can see here. If I use different visualizations, like, for example, this parallel plot um, of the same data set, now each line represents a rock or a mine. Uh, the mines are rent. So, and I see basically my 60 columns here at the, at the bottom. So now still, I don't really see any patterns. It's really hard to see. Maybe, maybe here on the left around attribute 11, red looks like it's a little bit higher than blue. And the same is here in the mid forties, same story there. It looks, red looks a little bit higher than blue, but it's kind of chaotic and even different visualizations give me the idea that probably my first assumption was right around attribute 11, 12, red is a little bit higher mid 40s, red is higher, low 20s, red is higher, mid 30s, blue is higher. So I see certain areas, certain regions, which probably are more important than uh, the other areas where in the, in the frequency spectrum, which doesn't really, they don't really help me to, to distinguish between those two groups. All right, so we know certain frequency bands are more important than others. So let's actually first just build the models on all of those frequency bands to get a bench, benchmark, basically. And if I do this for this first five-fold cross-validation now, I get a 67.8%, so almost 68% accuracy. So let's remember this number because that's going to be our benchmark. So no feature selection at all, 68%. Good. All right, so we know that one. So now let's move on to forward selection then. Uh, if I find my mouse at least. So similar setup, I retrieve the data set. I use the forward selection operator, which uh, is just one of the operators you will find here. If uh, I just type in forward selection, you will, you will find it here, okay? And then inside of the forward selection, you see this little icon again. Again, I need to calculate somehow the performance. And I do this exactly the same way, again, with our five-fold cross-validation, same local random seed as I mentioned before, and it just looks the same. So I just reuse this building block I just had before and just feed it into this forward selection, and let's just run this one here. So that one now takes a little bit. It's not as bad as doing a brute force approach as we calculated. That would be two t to the power of 60 uh, different combinations. There's no way that I could do brute force here. If I do forward selection, it's definitely delivering better results. So instead of the 68%, I get 77.4%. So that's much better. And most of the features actually get a zero here. So they have been deselected and only four features have been selected. And in fact, I can see this in the data here as well. In fact, the, all the features which have been selected are in this attribute 11, 12 region, but we didn't select any, any features from the low 20s, mid 30s, or mid 40s, which have been those other areas in the frequency spectrum which seem to be important. Here, we really feel forward selection kind of stopped too early. It just focused on this one, didn't get any better by adding a fifth feature, and just, just stopped there. And yeah, granted, it's already much better, almost 10% more accuracy, great, much smaller feature sets, so that's good. But is this good enough? Well, let's see. So let's then move on to backward animation. Now we turn it around um, and basically start with all the features. So same setup than before inside the cross-validation, all the same. We start with all the features and omit features until we no longer get any better. So I run this one here now again, and it takes a couple of seconds. 
But then I see like, ooh, well, it's again a little bit better than using all the features. You remember the benchmark of 68%, but it's not as good as doing the forward selection. So I'm somewhere in the middle. And frankly, look at that. Only like what eight features have been removed. All the rest is still in there. So the data set is still huge. So it's not really good. I didn't really got rid of a lot of different features. And yeah, well, I certainly covered all the four spectrums, but I also covered all the noise uh, everywhere else, which is exactly the reason why it's just not good. All right, so the next one now is the evolutionary selection. So again, you just would basically look for um, the, the operator here. You will, oh, sorry, that's the parameters, optimize selection evolutionary. And it's the same setup again in a cross validation. The only thing I changed, I also added some logging so we can see how we basically get better over time by doing the, uh, the optimization. But everything else here is the same. So let's run it and let's go quickly to the results because then you can see that we basically add all those results here. Um, so oh, look at that, they're already getting pretty good, 83% almost, so now we are done. And we in fact end up with like an 80% accuracy. This is the data we've been looking on, like the accuracy, or, um, at, this is the accuracy for each generation. I can also plot it like this. Uh, let's just so just the color here. So you can see when we started the optimization run, we actually have been hardly any better than uh, doing no feature selection at all. You remember the 68% benchmark. But then quickly we, we have been becoming much, much, much better. And then kind of asymptotically, we get closer to, to the optimum here towards the right. So after like 30 generations, we end up with the best feature set. But now let's have a look at the features actually. So this one here selected roughly what, 10, 11 features here? And look at that, 11, 12, low 20, mid 30s, and also the mid 40s. So in fact, it covered all the relevant areas of our, um, of our data set. And if I look now into the chart, you see already how everything actually is distinguished in a much better way. And that's why this model is so much better. Okay, that's great. So um, evolutionary algorithms are awesome for, for getting much more accurate models. But that's still not the end of the story because we didn't really focus also on reducing complexity. And that is, that is in fact, um, which brings the true conflict because so far we only have been optimizing for the accuracy. That means often we tend to take more features because then the model gets more information, but we don't really optimize for using only fewer features, which reduce model complexity. And those two goals, again, are conflicting. At least it, they start to be conflicting at some point. And this is, as I said in the beginning, is one of the major problems in machine learning. Here, this is the formula, which everybody of you should know. This is kind of one of the base formulas in the statistical learning. Um, and that is the, the formula, or one of the kind of like basis formula for, for how to calculate what we call the regularized risk. And regularization is something I mentioned in the beginning. So the whole idea is you basically take the empirical risk, which is just a fancy term for the training error in most of the cases, and you take the structural risk. Structural risk, for example, for an SVM would be the wider the margin is to your data points, the, uh, the, the, the smaller is the structural risk. Here, in our case for feature selection, structural risk, again, is just a fancy term, and it just means the number of features. If you have more features, you have a higher structural risk. And then you turn this into a regularized risk by introducing some trade of factor C. But how on earth, you don't even know how good your model is going to perform, nor do you know if now five out of those 60 features or 50 features are the better range. So how could you ever define, before you know anything about the data or your models, how could you ever define a trade off factor? So in fact, you can't. That's why, for example, if you do this with an SVM, you need to run a parameter optimization for, for C. And by the way, this was the one part of my PhD which also worked. It's just not worth the effort because you can avoid this by, by actually doing this as an explicit multi-objective optimization as well. But for feature selection, since it's a multimodal fitness landscape, you can actually do this. Instead of defining a trade-off, you can optimize for both things at the same time. But how? And that is actually something uh, an Italian economist uh, is, was very well known for, uh, Signor Pareto. Most people will probably know him for the very well known 80 20 rule. Okay? But he came up with some other concept, and that's called a Pareto front. And here we have such a Pareto front. So if you, for example, have the number of influence factors on the, on the x axis here, 
and the accuracy of your models on the on the y-axis now you can take every feature set you're evaluating and um, this is for example part of your population as part of the evolutionary algorithm and you can plot it on this two-dimensional space for your two cr conflicting criteria so this point here on the left means for example i only use one feature and i get a 60 percent accuracy the next one here means I use two features and get roughly 75%, then three features with 80, and so on. So all those data points are kind of equally good because you can't really say, well, the one with three features and 80% is better than the one with two features and 75%. Yeah, it's more accurate, but it also uses more features. So if those are two conflicting goals, there's no really any way to say one is better than the other. But what we do know is that we want to move this whole front towards the bottom, uh, sorry, the top left corner. So we want to use as little features as possible and get as high accuracy as possible, okay? So the whole goal is while we are optimizing, we want to use, move the whole Pareto front towards the top left in this chart. If you use different criteria, of course, you might move somewhere else, but maximizing or optimizing both criteria at the same time. So, so that should be clear. So how can you do this? And that is the one change you need to do in the evolutionary algorithms. Um, you, you change the selection scheme into something we call non dominated sorting. And the basic idea is really simple. Um, if you, for example, look at another data point like this blue one here, is this a good data point? I mean, really think about this. It's three features with like 53% accuracy. Well, no, it's not really good because if you use three features, actually I have another feature set which already has 80% accuracy, so it's definitely not good there. And I can even reach 60% with using even fewer features, like, like the one with only one feature on the left. So, so that is really a bad point, so let's get rid of it. And the one here on the right, it's not that clear, but the same story. Yeah, it is an 85% accuracy, but you can reach 85% already with one feature less. So why not go on with the one with five features and 85% accuracy? Same story here. So yeah, it's only one feature, that's nice. But actually, I have a better attribute set with only one feature. So again, those three points are just not good. And that is actually true for all the blue points you see on the screen right now. There's actually a term for that. We say that all the orange points are dominating uh, the blue points, okay? But the blue points are dominated. And this whole idea of non-domination or non-dominated sorting is, well, maybe we should first focus on the points which dominate all the others, and then we put them into the next generation's population. And then we find the next rank of dominating data points and put them into the next generation and so on until our desired population size is reached. So those orange, five orange points are the first rank, so we put them into the next generation. And then we find the next set of dominating data points, those five, for example, let's say our target population size is 12, so we add those five points as well. Now we have only two spots left, let's go with those two then from the next rank. And that is the whole idea of, of this new selection uh, scheme, okay? So that's the only change we do in our, in our feature selection. And the result will be this Pareto front, and it will naturally move towards the, uh, the top left. All right, let's do it then. Let's go back into Rapid Miner and, and let's just have a look how this whole thing looks like. So in order to turn this single objective um, optimization into a multi-objective optimization, all you need to do is do three minor changes. The first change is in the um, selection operator itself. Somewhere down here, you have this selection scheme, which typically is tournament selection. That was the one I explained first. You need to change it to non-dominated sorting. So that's the first change. Then I go inside here. And I go inside of the cross-validation, and sometimes you don't need to make this change, but you should make sure that your performance criterion is only delivering exactly one performance criterion, because otherwise the multi-objective optimization might get confused if you, for example, select two here, let's say accuracy and whatever, uh, the relative error, well, should I now do the multi-objective optimization for accuracy and the error here, or should I do it for the number of features? So make sure you only pick one uh, here, and then you add a second one, which is the third little change, where which is in just another operator here, which is called performance attribute count. So you add this one here. So that means you will add, uh, end up, if I make a breakpoint here again, and I just run it until there, you will end up with the performance vector, which has the accuracy first, and then the number of attributes, in this case, six attributes, okay? So um, that's the change you have to make, and then I just make a little bit more, so I also show this population plotter here. 
so we can just see how this Pareto front is moving over time. So here we have it. Um, those You see, while the optimization is running, um, we move, in this case, to the top right, and that's just like because we optimize the negative number of attributes. So if you want to minimize the attributes, you could also maximize the negative number of attributes. It, it's the same thing, okay? So we want to move to the top right. And we did after like hundreds of uh, generations. Uh, this is the Pareto front. So I see if I only have one attribute, I can get like 73% accuracy. And this goes up to our like 82, 83% if you use nine attributes. But there's no point in using more than nine attributes because we won't get any better. And I also can sort this, for example, have a look into the data. And this is now, since the runtime is pretty much the same as doing the single objective one, this is the big advantage why I'm saying you're not just getting better models, you also get also more insights. Because if you only go with one feature, go with attribute 12 then. But if you can allow yourself two features, you see that attribute 12 is no longer the best one. It's actually changing over to attribute 11 and 36. And that is exactly the reason why forward selection will fail in many cases, because the, this is the, the nature of this multimodal fitness landscape that like for more fe bigger feature sets, it's not just like an, a super set always from the previous one, okay? And also you learn something about this. Like you now have an understanding like, okay, well, there's a shift um, between, between smaller feature set size and bigger feature set sizes. And you see that different attributes then contribute to the bigger size. And here actually a second shift, shift somewhere down here, but in the interest of time, I'm not going there. And then at the end, you can just pick whatever it is. Like if you want to go for accuracy, sure, you can still do that. But again, you get a diverse uh, optimization run. You get a lot of different results. You get very accurate models. You will learn more, uh, more about that. And you also see how is it really worth adding like three or four more features and make your modeling, let's say, double as, as slow by just doubling the number of features. Is it worth doing it if you only gain 0.5% accuracy? And often the answer will be no. So that's why this is such an important thing. All right. So in the remaining couple of minutes, I would like to show you um, and take you on this little journey for unsupervised feature selection because I personally think that is a very, very exciting side effect. And instead of discussing all the theory now, I will really just show it to you right away um, and, and show you what the problem actually is. So I generated a data set. Um, let's have a look at this data quickly, which is a random data. Um, well, not exactly random, to be honest, um, somewhat random. Um, it's only two columns, attribute one and attribute two here. And if I plot those two columns, you clearly see, I hope, that we have four different clusters. So any clustering scheme, uh, let's say we use k-means and we say I would like to find four clusters, should come up with those four clusters. And that's exactly what this proxy is doing. Of course, since it's a distance-based method, we normalize the data first. And then I say, like, yeah, I would like to find four clusters. Let's run this whole thing. And I see, yeah, here's the results. If I um, visualize the clusters, okay, the colors change a little bit, but that's not the point. The point is, yeah, we found four clusters. Brilliant. Now, let's add some noise. I just quickly show you the data again. If I add some noise, I still have the same two columns than before, but I added five total random columns. Again, if I plot this in the original two columns, I have my four clusters. But if I change one of them to random, ooh, things look a little bit ugly already. If I go with two random, random uh, columns here, then there is simply no pattern. So of course, our hope would be, if you cluster this data, maybe the clustering scheme itself will figure out what are the important attributes. But in fact, it doesn't. So even if I look at the data after I clustered this, um, so I now show the cluster here again, in the two original attributes, you can see like, yeah, red and blue all overlapping, green and yellow all overlapping. And even, I mean, things get even worse if I go into the random here, like, yeah, it, it found some clusters, quote unquote, but they're just not good. So without feature selection, there's no way that we can find them. Uh, well then, well, let's just add feature selection then. What's the worst which can happen? Well, okay, let's just jump to the evolutionary feature selection and let's just do a single objective one first and let's actually try to find the best feature sets. So typically I would ask you now, what are you going to expect? And most people would say like, well, I want to see my two features, attribute one and two, and all the noise features are gone. But that's actually not what is going to happen. So if you see the results in a second now, what we're going to see is, well, I optimize for something which is called the davis boldin Index, which measures the average distance of the data points in the clusters. But in fact, I only end up with one column, attribute two, and all the rest gets deselected. Well, 
Why? I mean, why, why is it omitting the other one? Well, frankly, that's actually kind of hard to, to visualize, but if, uh, I mean, because all the data is condensed down to only one dimension, that means if you only go with one dimension, the clusters are even more dense than if you go with two dimensions. It's like you have a sponge and then you just press it, the density of the sponge, sponge will increase. So it's good for the cluster to go with as little features as possible. And that actually is a problem. Well, okay, so that means whenever you do feature selection for clustering, it will always use the smallest number of features, which is one. And it will always pick the one feature which provides the highest level of density. Well, okay, so single objective optimization apparently doesn't work. Let's go with multi-objective optimization. So same setup than before, non-dominated sorting. Let's run this one here. Oh, good, I have a Pareto front here. Let's Let's have a look. Oh, wait, what happens here? I, why? I only have one data point. Like, this is one feature of some. I can't say this, but shoot. Why happened that now? My final result is my whole Pareto front collapses down to one point, and again, it only has one feature. And the reason is because those two goals are not conflicting. Minimizing the number of features and maximizing the density of your clusters are not conflicting. So that's why it's not going to work. So what you have to do is one small trick. And that's the only thing I change here. I not, no longer minimize the number of features, I maximize the number of features. I let this whole thing run again. And while it is running now, we see indeed a Pareto front. We see that actually we get results between or using only one feature here. Now I'm actually maximizing the features. That's why it's not negative any longer. I have only one or two features here on the right up to using all the features here at the, on, the, on the left, or almost all, like six out of the seven. So I get a full Pareto front. And if I sort this now here, you see, well, sure, if I only need to use one, then I actually should go with attribute two. But then I have my desired solution here, which you wouldn't find otherwise. And then observe this huge jump in the davis boolean index between those two solutions here, and then the next one, which adds random. So that's a clear indicator, indicator something is going on. So you should have a look somewhere in the, in the results, like, like around this, this huge jump. You see it even here in the Pareto front, those who are here far on the right, but then you have this huge jump uh, when you start adding the noise features. So you would now observe actually the different features, select all the different feature sets, and then pick the right result based on that. And that is what the true power of multi-objective optimization is. You will actually be even able to solve unsupervised feature selection as well. But keep in mind, in this case, you're not minimizing, but maximizing the number of features. Otherwise, the goals are not even conflicting. So that concludes um, uh, the, the, the whole topic about how important multi-objective optimization is, how much you can learn from it, and how much you actually can improve your models with this. Um, I mean, also, I hope as a side effect, you really got the idea of like how great it actually is to do all this real data science stuff, but in a fast and simple way. I mean, of course, I love coding. I, I, I sometimes do code actually quite often still, and that's all fine. That's part of many data scientists' work, but it doesn't have to be. You can also go really with the visual approach, have some fun while doing this, and get to some good results, which is why many, many, many people are loving us, since I would like to get to some questions here and not spending a lot of time here. But if you're not a rapid miner user uh, already, please check it out. It's really a very powerful platform for actually solving your real data science tasks. So a couple of key takeaways. Multi-objective optimization, in my opinion, really should become a standard tool in your tool belt, especially for feature selection, both for supervised, but even unsupervised feature selection. And you will not just get better models, but also you will understand more about the relationships of your features in your data, which I think is maybe even more important. And of course, please, use RapidMiner to do all of this. Um, before we get to Kresten's last uh, comments, I wrote actually a couple of blog posts on this topic. They're all online. You will find them on our blog, so check it out on rapidminer.com slash blog. Um, there's a series of four different uh, blog posts, and you can actually also download the data and the processes and run those processes yourself uh, in RapidMiner if you like. And that's it, but I think we have a couple of minutes for questions. Yeah, so thanks, Ingo. Um, that was a great presentation. As a reminder to those on the line, I have been getting a couple questions. We will be sending the recording of today's presentation within the next few business days to everyone that went ahead and registered. Uh, so like Ingo said, now it's time to go ahead and um, answer your questions. I've seen a lot of questions come through. If you guys have questions, please go ahead and uh, input those in the questions panel on the right-hand side of your screen. I'll go ahead and take a look through those now. 
Um, my first question here is, what are some good parameter values for the evolutionary algorithm? Um, yeah, oh, that's excellent. Um, um, I would say it, well, it doesn't really matter like that much, to be honest, but a good best practice is for the population size, I often go with something like, 10% um, of your feature set size up to like 30%. So if you, for example, for, for the solar data set, I, um, we had like 60 features. I often go with like something between 10 and 20 individuals. Um, so you basically can span a lot of different uh, areas of your, of, your, of your fitness landscape. For the number of generations, it's really like, well, let it run as long as you have time. So I typically start with a small number, like sometimes even only five or 10 to see how, how, how far I can get with only a small number of generations. And if that one quickly and have some time to spend, well, let's double it and let's run it longer. If still have some time left, oh, well, we'll double it again. So 10 to 30% of the feature set size for the size of the population, and then start with 10 generations or something in that, in that range, and then uh, depending, of course, how long your modeling takes, um, increase it from there until you really figure out that you're getting closer to this optimization um, like area, but it's probably not worth running it much longer. So that's kind of like, I would say, the, the rule of thumb there. Okay. Uh, next question here is, this person is asking, uh, once the evolutionary algorithm feature, feature selection is finished, how do you op operationalize it? Oh, good. Um, well, you see that you, for example, get this attribute weights uh, object here as a result. And what you can do then, if you have, let's assume you have some data prep processes here in RevMiner, so you, you basically run with the, with the application set so you want to actually make the prediction for, you run this to the same kind of data pre-processing, you do this for the training set. I mean, and there's things like called, which are called pre-processing models in RapidMiner to make sure that you're basically really doing exactly the same things on your, on your application set as well. But then uh, the next step is to basically apply those selection or those weights here. And there's an operator for that, which is called select by weights. So you basically take those attribute weights here and the data set, which is the result of the pre-processing, and then it will um, select the same feature subset. And then afterwards, you take the model, or sorry, which I didn't deliver, but you can just deliver the model or retrain even the model on the same feature set and um, apply this then. And there's a lot of different helper methods in RapidMiner than what you can do with this model as well. So I keep it at that, but there's a lot of operators and functions in RapidMiner to put the models then into production and, and doing the right things in an efficient way. Great. Uh, thanks for answering that. So this person is asking, uh, is it possible to get a copy of the rapid minor processes uh, um, as well as the video? So I did mention we're, we're going to be sending the recordings, but I believe the processes are also included in the blog post as well. So Absolutely. So you can check out um, you can check out this URL here. You will find a couple of posts on the multi-objective optimization, four in total. And at the end of each of those blog posts, you will find links to, to like a zip file, which comes with all the processes. So you can import them into rapid minor and, and run them there. Great. Uh, next question here is, does the exact implementation of the evolutionary algorithm matter? Um, no, not at all. Uh, I mean, I, I have really, I've been doing like at least 10 different kinds of implementations and, and different types of crossover. And it really doesn't matter that much. I mean, if you want to do like hardcore optimization, of course, you, you would like to actually improve on, on that front. But um, it's a relatively simple optimization task, actually, uh, compared to many other much more complex tasks. And it's, it's not worth the effort in, in trying to optimize those implementations uh, really that much. I, yeah, no. Great. Uh, another question here is, uh, this person says that they normally deal with categorical data. Is this approach good for dealing with that type of data as well? Um, yeah. It doesn't matter at all if it's categorical or not. I mean, um, it, of course, it depends a bit on the modeling you're using. So let's say um, your model needs to do some pre-processing first. Now, the big question is because maybe the model doesn't work with uh, categorical data, and um, then you do like dummy encoding and this kind of things. So now the big question is, do you do the encoding before you feed into the feature selection, or let you do the, are you doing this inside of the feature selection? Um, I tend to do it inside of the feature selection, but both is possible, and it definitely works in, in both cases. Great. Another question here. Um, this person is asking, do the different models misclassify the same items, and can we gain insights from analyzing any of the misclassified sets? Um, I, yeah, I guess you can, although that's kind of uh, not connected to the, to the actual feature selection problem. Um, so, yeah, you can, you can, of course, run different. Well, it's kind of connected. Sorry, I take that back. You could run multiple different optimization methods. You could get different um, feature bit vectors then. You can then train the different models and basically see how they behave 
And um, well, one of the things, I'm not sure if I did install it, yeah, super quickly. I mean, um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but just super quickly. One of the things which is in part of the next upcoming RapidMiner 8.1.1 release, which is coming out in a couple of weeks, uh, might be interesting here, which I would like to show you is this uh, new operator explained predictions, where after you did all the training and and, and, um, and feature selection and everything else, you can actually um, apply the um, the model to new data sets uh, or even the same one if you want to, and then you get more insight in how those predictions actually have been created by those models. So for example, here, the satanic data set. So here, this is the yes prediction, despite the fact that this is a man, and, um, and for this data set, men have a slower, smaller likelihood of survival, mainly supported, that's why it's green by the passenger class. So you get this kind of like insights and for comparing different models and see, you can see if they actually make sense. There's something else in there which is called the model simulator, I'm not showing it to you now in the interest of time, but, but you can also play around and see how the model behaves. That's definitely something if you're interested in this kind of thing, which is worth checking out. The beta, beta release is open, uh, so you can, you can actually download the beta version at this point. Great, thanks. Uh, so it looks like we're just about time here. Um, don't want to take up anyone else's um, time, but if we weren't able to address your, your question here on the line, we will make sure to follow up with you via email uh, within the next few business days. So uh, thanks again, Ingo, for a great presentation, and thanks again, everyone, for joining us. Absolutely. Thanks, Mike.